Okay. Good morning. Glad to see you on this beautiful Tuesday. We uh, are continuing our journey through 1 Peter. We're at 1 Peter chapter 3. We will cover the second half of the chapter, verses 13 through 22. Uh, we are using the New King James Version as our particular version of the Bible. Uh, it's the one I use most. to take care of my Bible bag and just very familiar. It's interesting to me. I don't always, I'm not always able to quote a verse or something like that, but I know where it's at in my Bible. I know what page it's on. I know if it's on the top, the bottom, right, you know, it's just that familiarity with this Bible uh, has just been interesting to me. So let's have a prayer and we will begin our time together on this good Tuesday morning with 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 13 through 22. Father we love you. Your love for us goes beyond our understanding. We uh, just appreciate the fact that you do love us and Father we appreciate the fact as you fill us with your love we have a greater capacity to love those around us. And Father, it's out of our love for you and out of our love for others that we want to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We just want to love them with the love of Christ and then tell them why we're doing it. That's just who you are and that's what you're about. You've told us to go into all the world making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that you have taught us. So Father, we're about being disciples that we might be disciple makers as you work in us and through us. Father, just continue to fill us with your life-giving Holy Spirit. May your Spirit fill us to the overflow that those around us may be touched and blessed by the presence of God in us. Thank you for our time together today as we continue to journey through your Word. We pray your blessings upon this journey. We ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Bless those who are in the sanctuary with us this morning. Bless those who are joining us uh, online for Bible study today. We love you again, Father, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to share with you 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22, and then we'll go back and uh, take a closer look at these verses. Again, Peter writing to the churches that are scattered around Asia Minor, or who we would know as uh, Turkey in the present day and time, writes this, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached, to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So again, Peter addresses proper conduct in the body of Christ. And on this particular occasion, the second half of 1 Peter chapter 3, he begins to speak about suffering for right and wrong. So he proposes the question, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? So have you ever seen anyone who lives a good life and does good things receive trouble and persecution and heartache from other people? So you can live a good Christ-like life. You can do good and be punished or suffer hardship 
for doing that or, or enjoying and engaging in that kind of life. Well, absolutely, and Peter knew that. Uh, Peter knew exactly that. The Christians there in Asia Minor knew that, and Peter is addressing that very thing. We may very well suffer harm even as we are followers of what is good. That's always subject to happen. Some people have kind of, kind of thought, well, maybe he's not talking about your physical body or your outward life. Who is he who will harm you? You talking more about your spirit and your soul. I mean, they may be able to hurt you on the outside, but they can't take away your salvation. They can't take away your relationship with God. And, and, and some people have thought maybe that's what Peter was talking about. He could be talking about both those things. Uh, we don't know. But certainly is the case that those who live for God are going to suffer trouble from those who do not. We see that Old Testament in you. We find it in Psalm 34, a very familiar psalm. You may remember these verses. I'm going to read verse 19 through 22. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. You all remember hearing that in the past? Many, not one, not two, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Why is that? Why are the righteous afflicted? Sin. We live in a fallen world. We have been created in the likeness and the image of God. And when we live into that likeness and image of God by being in relationship with God, covenant relationship with God, the enemy does not like that. He does not want to see God in us and lived out through us. So the enemy comes after or against that which has been made in the likeness and image of God. When we embrace that, that means we reject evil and sin in the world. We reject the devil and everything that he's about. And he wants to try to take us down because he wants to take God down. And even to this day, it doesn't seem like he's learned the lesson. That is something he'll never be able to do. He will never defeat God and he will never defeat the Christian. What does the Bible say? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Well, Christ is in us and Satan's in the world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. What? Even our faith. Our faith in who? Our faith in what? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So the enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, roams about seeking whom he may devour. Resist steadfast in the faith. We're holding on to Jesus. We're saying, devil, you can't have me. You can't have my family. You just might as well go somewhere and pick on somebody else because your power has been broken in Christ Jesus and we stand in his power and in his, in his life. And the devil didn't like that. And, and when you start bringing light into the darkness and you start damaging the kingdom of darkness, he's going to come against you because now you are a threat. There's been several occasions in my pastoral ministry that people began to pray for something, let's say the salvation of a particular person. And instead of things getting better, they got worse. And they acted surprised. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If you start messing in the devil's playground, trying to bring somebody out of that life into the kingdom of God, he's going to get mad. He's going to stir things up. So when we come against him, that's exactly what he tries to do. We see that happen over and over again in the book of Acts. As Peter and, and the, uh, the disciples, the apostles go out and preach the kingdom of God, as Paul and Silas and Barnabas go out, they went out preaching good tidings, doing good things. And what happened? People came against them. But what? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, do we? But against those principalities and powers that work in and through that person that's flesh and blood. So just make sure you're the person that Christ is working in and through, not the person the devil's working in and through. So that's a quick, <laughs> that's a quick aside on why many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord, are you ready for the good news? But the Lord delivers them, delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Jesus again picks up on this theme in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, 
verse 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So the psalmist tells us that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but then Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this is nothing new. This is absolutely nothing new. Go all the way back to who? Cain and Abel. Why did Cain come against Abel? Because Abel's gift was pleasing to God and Cain's was not. Cain did not offer his best. And after Cain had killed Abel, it says in Genesis that God told Cain, sin lies at the door and its desire is to have you. But you must master it. You must overcome it. But there it is. Uh, as early as those early chapters of Genesis, I think that's four or five, maybe chapter five. Sin lies at the door and its desire is to have you. Its desire is to have anybody that's made in the likeness, in the image of God. So we have to do what God said, what Jesus said. Live in victory over it. But you kind of wonder, I mean, if we are living a godly life, a Christ-like life, and we are trying to do what is good for ourselves and people around us, what is it that goes on in their heart and mind that would make them want to harm us? Who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? And, and, and what is the motivation behind it? Why do the wicked hate the righteous? Well, we know it's all motivated through Satan and the sin that he brings to the world. But, but as I studied through this particular passage this past week, I came upon something in one of the commentaries that referred me to the wisdom of Solomon. Now, the wisdom of Solomon is in the Apocrypha. Uh, some of the older Bibles you have have 16 books between the Old Testament and the New called the Apocrypha. Apocrypha means hidden. So it's, it's hidden wisdom, hidden understanding, shared. Um, but like my Bible doesn't include the Apocrypha and, be, and it's because they don't, a lot of scholars, most scholars don't feel like they were inspired by God. Uh, a lot of the Apocrypha writings do not refer to any other books of the Bible or biblical writings. Just like, I mean, Matthew refers back to Isaiah on many, many occasions, you know, showing us how the prophecy of the suffering servant of Jesus was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. So, here, here we have some writings that in some occasions uh, are, are, are included in Bibles, but they're not considered the inspired Word of God. With all of that said, I want you to hear, uh, and we're going to read this together. I'll put this one on the screen. This is the best illustration or understanding of what would be going on in a wicked person's mind as he thought about the righteous. And this is the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 12 through 20. We're gonna, I'm, not, I'm gonna try not to blow through this too quick. I, I just want you to soak this up and, and hear this as you're hearing it from another person's perspective. Somebody that's not good, not godly, has no relationship with God. Hear this. This is what they say, this is what they think, as written in the Wisdom of Solomon. Let us lie in wait for the righteous man because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and calls himself a child of the Lord. Well, dang, thank you for the compliment, right? If this is who we are as Christians and this is their perspective, I, I, that we're doing pretty good so far. It means we're doing our job as a Christian. We're teaching, we're preaching, we're setting a life example of what it is to live a godly life. We're being salt in the earth, light of the world. We're being who we're supposed to be. 
So that rubs salt in the wound of their sin. It shines light in the darkness of their eyes and their heart, and it's painful, and they want to do something about it. So let's go further. Let's go further. Hey, there we go. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts. The very sight of him is a burden to us because his manner of life is unlike that of others and his ways are strange. The world does think the ways of a Christian are strange. We are considered by him as something base and he avoids our ways as unclean. We would call that sin. He calls the last end of the righteous happy and boasts that God is his father. Well, at least they're getting this right, right? But they're looking at our life as a negative because it brings conviction or condemnation to their life of sin. We'll go on. Let us see if his words are true and let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's child, he will help him and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture so that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death for according to what he says, he will be protected. It doesn't matter what you do to me. I'm in God's hands. God will take care of me. So that's something a Christian would say. But then the unrighteous person, the wicked person, would go, well, let's see. He, he, he boasts about being a humble, gentle person. Let's tighten the screws on him a little bit. Let's put some pressure on him. Let's persecute him. Let's slander him. And let's see if he continues to be gentle. What happens when you squeeze an orange? What do you get? You get what kind of juice? You squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. If you squeeze a grape, what do you get? If you squeeze an apple, what do you get? If you squeeze a Christian, what do you get? Christian juice. Christian juice. That's one of my favorite children's moments Christian Jews. When the people of the world, when the circumstances of the world put the pressure on, squeeze us, the only thing that should come out or emerge is Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit. We don't have oranges and apples and grapes inside of us. We have love, peace, joy, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such there is no law. That's what's supposed to come out. And the sinner is going, we're going to find out whether or not that's true. We're going to put it to the test. We're going to see if they are who they say they are. How many times in the recent weeks have you heard me say in sermons and in Bible study, somebody's watching you. You can rest assured people are watching your life to see whether or not what you're professing is what you're living and what you're professing and what you're living is really true. You may be the only Bible someone reads and we want to make sure they hear the truth when they read our hearts, when they read our lives. So now, Peter, thinking about that question, thinking about suffering for righteousness' sake, does say in verse number 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness, righteousness sake, you're blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats or be troubled. And that's reflective of what Jesus said in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. If you suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. He tell, Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, 28, not to fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to both destroy soul and body in hell. So, you know, is there anybody in here today or, or, or joining us online that you enjoy pain? I, I mean, I don't go looking for pain. I try to avoid it as much as I can. That's, you know, that's why when I get out in the sun for an extended period of time, I have a cap on, baseball cap or another kind of cap with a, a, a rim on it. Brim on it. Is it brim or rim? 
Brim? Brim. I thought Brim was a fish you caught out of the lake. It is. B-R-E-A-M. We're talking about B-R-I-M, right? I knew that. I was just sitting for paying attention. You know, because if the top of my... Have you, some of you ladies don't know what I'm talking about. If you ever get the top of your head blistered, you know, that's just the pain all in by itself. Because then you take a shower and you got the hair dryer and you're blowing hot air on it. And that's not the worst part. You want to know what the worst part is? Brush it. Brush a blistered head with a... That's pain. And No, thank you. No, thank you. I, no, thank you. I, I don't run to pain. I run from pain. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm scared of it, but I'll stay as far away from it as I can. But, but Peter tells us, don't be afraid of their threats. Jesus tells us, don't fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. You see, that's that dualism or, or, or you know, a couple of parts of who we are. We're body and we're soul. And that may be why some people thought when Peter said, who can hurt you? He's more talking about the soul that a man can't hurt, but God can. So he said, don't uh, fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul, but rather feel him, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And then he says, do not be afraid of their threats nor troubled. There's a lot of troubling in the world. You see that on the screen. And then that word trouble in the Greek means to cause one inward commotion. So we're talking about what's going on inside again. Don't let your soul be troubled. Don't allow inward commotion to take place. And when that happens, it takes away our calmness of mind, our inner peace. Because when that happens, we see one struck with fear and dread. And, and God has not given us a spirit of fear, as Paul writes to Timothy, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So God does not want us to live in fear. God wants us to live in a state of peace. We are at peace on the inside because we are at peace with God. We are in harmony and relationship with God so we can live in peace in relationship with God in the presence of God. So he, he, he gives us that encouragement and that exhortation. And then he, he says something that's really important. He says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Sanctify the the Lord in your hearts. Have you heard people refer to the Christian faith or your relationship with God as Jesus being your Lord and Savior? Is Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? And you know what? That Savior part's really good, isn't it? Because my sins have been forgiven. I've been washed clean. The guilt's been taken away. The penalty's been paid. And, and, and Jesus is my Savior. He's going to prepare a place for me. John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many mansions, and He's building one for me. He's coming back to get me. That where I am, there you may be also. Hey, that's, 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 that's good, isn't it? That's the gravy right there. That's good stuff. But what about Lord? What about Lord? Is He the Lord of your life? Is He governing your life? Does He sit, sit on the throne of your heart, directing, calling, Lord, you know, if you believe and know that you could be facing persecution and possibly even death, Jesus better be sitting on the throne of your heart. Because if anything other than Jesus is sitting on the throne of your heart, you're subject to walking away and denying your faith. But if Jesus is sitting on the throne of your heart, that means as the Lord of your life, you're going to respond the way Jesus would respond. And Jesus' response was never contradictory of the Father's will. No matter what he had to face, ridicule, scourging, crucifixion, he told the Father, I've come to do your will. As a matter of fact, he told the disciples in John's Gospel, he said, my meat, my food is to do the will of the Father. And no matter the cost, Jesus was about doing the will of the Father, even in the face of great persecution, great suffering, and great de and, and death. And that's exactly what he calls us to. That kind of obedience, that kind of following after God's will. And if that's going to take place in our lives, we have to have Jesus, not just as our Savior, but also as our Lord. The amplified version of verse 15 reads like this. But in your hearts, 
set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. That's what sanctify the Lord in your hearts means. But then he goes on to say, once you've done that, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness or humility and fear. Has anyone ever looked at you and said, why are you so nice? Why are you so loving? Why, why are you good to me? I was, I had the opportunity, I had the honor to visit a lady, her name was Melanie McIntosh, uh, in uh, ECM Hospital in Florence when I was pastor at Pleasant Hill from 2004 to 2009. This was the summer of 2004. I had a nurse that worked in my church and she told me about Melanie and she said, Pastor Ricky, I know Melanie's not one of your church members. I know you're just getting settled in. You just got here. But this lady's already coded twice. She's already died twice. They've got her back, code blue twice. And she said, this lady is not ready to die. You can <laughs> just listen to her talk. I mean, she, she could make a sailor blush by the language she used when she talked. And this lady was 40, 41 years old. And she'd already been in the hospital like three months and had no prospect of getting out of the hospital. So I, I told this, this lady, nurse, Renee, I said, okay, next time I'm in town, I'll stop by the hospital. If I got church members, I'll visit them. I'll go visit Melanie. If not, I'll just go visit Melanie. So I, I was at the hospital one day and, and I went to her room and I knocked on the door and she said, come in. And I opened up the door and I said, my name's Ricky Smith. I'm the pastor at Pleasant Hill down the highway. I was here visiting some church members. I thought you might like a visit. And she said, I'm not a very religious person. You might better spend your time elsewhere. And it's in those moments you go, okay, Holy Spirit, you need to really give me a good comeback. So I said, well, you know what? I'm not really a religious person myself, but I thought you might like a visit. Because, you know, religion can be a whole lot different than relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know y'all know what I'm talking about. So she said, okay, come in. Because Melanie had told me she hadn't received a visit from family or friend for weeks. And she has a husband. In, in word, obviously, maybe, anyway. So she said, come on in. We talked about everything under the sun. I found out she liked horses. She liked plants. She liked Chinese food. And we just talked about all kinds of stuff. And after an hour and a half, I said, well, I need to go. I've got some other things I need to do. Would it be okay for me to stop back by sometime when I'm back at the hospital? Oh, please do. Now, we went from, I'm not a very religious person. You might better spend your time elsewhere to, will you come back and see me the next time you're in the hospital? So, you know, I never tried to push Jesus down her throat. Uh, actually, what I did, she knew I was a pastor. So every once in a while, she'd kind of float out a question that would have to do with Jesus or Christianity or something like that. And one day she looked at me and she said, why do you smile all the time? And I said, because Jesus lives in my heart. I said, I have a smile on my heart that shows through on my face. That's why I smile all the time. Because she talked about I smiled and I laughed and different things like that. And uh, so she was seeing that, that Christ in me and through me. And she said something one day that really blew my mind. She said, I've been looking for you people all my life. You're talking about stunned. You know what was she was looking for? She was looking for those people who were genuine Christians. Followers of Christ who weren't there to judge her because she had a whole lot you could judge her about. Who were just there to love her, to show her the love of God. Because by that time I had other church members coming and visiting with her as well. We just kind of adopted her uh, as our family. But she said, I've been looking for you people all my life. And after several months of my visiting and the church visiting, she gave her heart to Jesus. And I had the honor and privilege of leading her in that prayer. It's one of the highlights of my spiritual journey. But he says, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you and do it with meekness and fear. 
Do it with humility toward others and fear toward God. Because when somebody asks you about your relationship with Jesus Christ, it must come across the right way. It has to be genuine. Because they'll spot a fake and a phony 10 miles away. And it has to be with love and humility because that's who Jesus is. And there's people out there in the world who are looking for people like Jesus. And they're very, very happy when they find that person. Think about the impact it made on the, 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 the soldiers, the guards who guarded Paul while he was in prison. You remember when he was cast in the prison, he's singing at midnight, him and Silas. The earthquake came, the doors opened, the shackles fell off, the guard came. He thought they had all escaped, he was going to kill himself. Paul said, nope, we're all still here. And in, in Paul's witness, Paul's defense, led that person to Jesus, made an impact on that guard's life, so much so that he became a Christian. So we've got to be ready to give a defense, an explanation for the hope that is within us. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Now that good conscience may be due to the fact that you had a ready answer, a good, sincere answer to tell them about the hope that's in you. But a, con a good conscience also may, may be there just simply as the fruit of living such a Christian life that someone would ask the question in the first place. So what's going to give me a good conscience before God? Number one, that I am living as God desires me to live in and through Christ Jesus. How many of you sleep good at night? <laughs> I do too. And I want to tell you what, I cherish the fact that I sleep good at night. And what I mean by I sleep good at night, I sleep good at night because my conscience is not bothering me. My conscience is not bothering me because I know and God knows that I'm doing the best I can do. And I'm leaning hard on Jesus because my best <laughs> is not much. But my, my effort paired together with his effort is a great thing, okay? So I can have a good conscience that I'm living right before God to the point that God would ask me about the life, somebody would ask me about the life I live, and then I can have a good conscience because I truly have a good answer to share. Because I'm living a life that I can talk about, that, that I'm happy with, that God's happy with. And, and even as you do that, as you live with a good conscience, there may still be people who are going to speak evil of you, defame you as evildoers, revile your good conduct. But when push comes to shove, and when they're called to give account for their defamation or the evil things they say about you or the slander they may say against you, then, as Peter says, they're going to be ashamed because people are going to say, that's not how that person really is. What are you talking? Why are you talking bad about them? Brother, why are you talking bad about them? You know that's not who they are. People will come to their defense. They will be proven wrong. And whether they admit it or not, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. And it may just be one day when they stand before Jesus, Jesus at the judgment and Jesus just looks and says, why would you give Bart such a hard time? Why'd you lie about sharing like that? You know Kathy was a good person. Why'd you go out there and spread all those rumors in the community? You ought to be ashamed. Could you imagine? Do you remember when you were a kid and your parent or somebody else said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself? What if you were standing before Jesus and Jesus said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself? What you said about them. You talk about shrinking down to nothing. Oh, my goodness. But we'll leave that in his hands, right? We'll leave that in his hands. 
having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. But remember, he says, your good conduct. We're still talking about Christian conduct. Now we're talking about it in the midst of suffering. And then he goes on to say, for it is better... If it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So here the question is, who has suffered for doing good according to God's will? Who is somebody you know who has suffered for doing good according to God's will? Well, the ultimate example is Jesus, which is the one that he then follows this question with. So, who is somebody else that you know has suffered because they endeavor to do God's will? Missionaries do, absolutely. One of the things that comes to my mind are the Christians who are still left in Afghanistan. And the Taliban has made it pretty clear, you know, if we can find you, we're going to kill you. So, you know, that, you know, they're, they're, they're suffering for the will of God. They're living Christian life and, and may very well lose their lives for it. Uh, oh, and the door was closed, so the nurse was willing to put her job on the line to pray for you before a surgery. Wow. Sounds like she is, is being a light in the darkness and salt of the earth. And yeah, she's not going to let threats get in the way of her being a Christian. Wow, that's beautiful. And aren't you glad for those doctors and nurses who say, hey, can I pray for you before surgery? Yes. I, oh, my goodness. I, I love it. I love it. And, and, see, and I, here's what I don't understand. Instead of saying, no, they can't do that, you have the right to refuse it. No, thank you. I don't, I don't believe in prayer. And, and that's the end of it. But instead of taking that approach, they go, no, you can't do it at all. Well, what if you have people in the hospital who want prayer from their doctors or nurses? I, I mean, a lot of times now, even when you are admitted into the hospital, they ask you a thousand questions. One of the questions is, are you a person of faith? Are you Baptist, Methodist, Catholic? I mean, some of them ask you questions like, would you like a visit from the chaplain? But then you turn around and say, well, the doctors and nurses can't pray for you. Uh, they are subject to losing their job. But it doesn't make, doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense. But there's a lot of things in the world that make sense to me, okay? Surprise, surprise, surprise. So then, you know, Peter begins to talk about the suffering of Christ. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just, the innocent, the holy, for the unjust, the guilty, the unholy, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, you and I very well know that the sufferings of Jesus are many. I mean, you could start with something as, as common to us as, as broken relationships or disappointment in relationships or betrayal by someone you thought was your friend. I mean, those things hurt. I, I mean, don't you think that there was some pain there when Judas came back to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and betrayed him there to the temple guards? Don't you know that had to be a little painful? I mean, because Jesus went out of his way to, to, to minister to all of his disciples equally. I mean, he treated Jesus, Judas just like he treated the rest of them, and he still betrayed Jesus. Or maybe, and, and he knew all of this was going to happen, that when he was arrested, they all scattered like scared mice. And he told them, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. And they did. But even though you know something is about to happen and you know it's going to be painful, does it relieve the pain? What does the nurse tell the kid? What does the nurse tell the parent? Got a shot in her hand. What does she say? This is going to hurt just a little bit. And you know it's coming, but it doesn't make the pain any less, does it? It just lets you know that it's coming. So Jesus had some relationship experiences. He had rejection of people that he came to minister the good news to. He was arrested. I mean, slapped. 
there when he was on trial, an innocent man being slapped. He was taken and scourged. Isaiah said that scourging, he was so marred that his visage, his, his image, his appearance did not even look human anymore. But they couldn't kill him. They couldn't kill him. They wanted to kill him, but they couldn't kill him because the Bible says he laid down his life. Jesus told the, t told the disciples, the Father has given me the power to lay my life down, to take my life up again. They didn't kill him. He gave his life for us. Had they just killed him, then that would not have fulfilled the purposes of God. You remember what Jesus said hanging on the cross? Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he breathed his last. He died on his terms. He didn't die on their terms. He could have hung on the cross for eternity. But that wasn't the plan. That wasn't the purpose. But it was part of the pain and the suffering that he endured. He had the sufferings of betrayal and broken relationships, the scourging, the suffering of being crucified on the cross, the suffering. Now, here's what really sets him apart from others. Others who have been martyred have gone through some very, very difficult suffering. But what truly makes Jesus different in his suffering was that the weight of the sin of the world was placed upon him. Nobody has borne the sin of the world in their body, hanging on the tree, as Peter would say, but Jesus has. Then there is the suffering of being treated like a sin-filled man, yet having never sinned. I just love this verse. Paul wrote it in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that beautiful? 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In Christ our guilt is taken away and we are freed from the penalty of sin. And then he says that he might bring us to God. That reminds me of Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, that's us being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So Jesus has made it possible that we might be brought to God, and he's the one that brings us to God. Father, here is another son, here is another daughter. They placed their faith in me and they have gained access through that faith to you and the grace in which they stand. And now they want to see and experience the very glory of God. So he goes on to say at the end of that verse, he was put to death in the flesh. And we know from the Gospels, Jesus hanging on the cross breathed his last. Mark chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, Matthew chapter 27, John chapter 19, all record the death of Jesus. He died. The mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. That's the hope that we have. So he died in the flesh. He was made alive by the Spirit. Okay. Who is responsible for raising Jesus from the dead? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes is the correct answer. Romans 6, 4, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. You mean God did it. John 2, 19, Jesus said he would raise himself up. He also said that again in John 10, 17 and 18. The Father's given me the power to lay my life down. He's given me the power to take it up again. So that's Father and that's Son. Romans 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, Holy Spirit. So the Bible says, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all had equal roles in raising Jesus from the dead. It is a action of the triune God. They always work in cooperation with each other. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John chapter 14. That's how wonderfully knit together they are. Now, is there anybody in here or out there that explain the Trinity to me? Tell me how you can be three in one. I've tried to explain it by saying, well, you know, we're a trinity. We're spirit, soul, and body. We've been created, created in the likeness and image of God. We have, a, we have a spirit with a soul. We live in a body. But that really doesn't fit Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then I say, well, I'm a trinity in some fashion. But this doesn't measure up to it either. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a father. I'm a brother. I'm, I'm I'm a, what's a four? If, a, if three's a trinity, what's a four? Quadrinity? I'm, you know, we'll make up words as we go, okay? Absolutely. You know, and we, and we try to find a lot of ways to explain and understand the trinity. And I think about Jesus when he was baptized in Luke chapter 3. How that he's there in the water. And the Father from heaven speaks, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So you got the voice of the Father in heaven coming down. you got Jesus standing in the Jordan River. And then the Holy Spirit in the form, shape of a dove descends upon Jesus and remains. So you have all three of them right there. You have all three of them in, in the creation account in Genesis. You have the Father who speaks. Jesus is the Word of God. The Spirit hovering over the water. The Spirit's there. The, the Spirit is that that. The, the Father speaks, the Spirit makes it happen. They all three work together. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Your wisdom doth show. So, they're all actively involved in that resurrection, but most of the time we would attribute that resurrection to the Holy Spirit. That, that's, you know, there you go. Okay. Boom. By whom? By who? Holy Spirit. By whom? Holy Spirit. Also, he went and preached to the spirits, little s, in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Now, does anybody want to come and tell me what that means? He went and preached to the, prison, to the spirits in prison. This is... Go, sir? Yes. Yes. You are exactly right. We have three options we're going to look at today. Option number one would be the Spirit of Christ speaking through Noah as he preached to his generation. So what did God instruct Noah to do? Two things. He said, build an ark because I've seen the wickedness of man and I'm going to destroy the earth. But he also told him to do something while he built the ark. And what was that? Preach. Tell them what you're doing. Tell them why you're doing it. Why would God want Noah to preach to the people that God is about to destroy? Hopefully somebody would come to faith in God. Absolutely. Jesus came into the world and he preached to people that hated him. And I just wished you would be quiet and leave us alone. The apostles did that. The early church, just be quiet and leave us alone. We can't be quiet and leave you alone. Because eternity is real. Judgment is real. God is real. And you need to know that it's real. Now, if you choose to turn a deaf ear to the preaching of the good news, then it's all on you. But we have a responsibility to preach. By the things we say, by the lives we live, so that the people of the world can see and know that there is a God in heaven, a Jesus who has come and lived on the face of the earth, and a Holy Spirit that is here right now drawing us to God. So one option in, in the commentary I read was the one by Holdren and Case on uh, First and Second Peter, and it's, it's a really good commentary. Uh, I have it on a... Bible software that I have on my laptop. It's called Logos, 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 however you pronounce it. Uh, it's a great Bible software. It's very expensive. 
I really saved up my pennies to get that one, but it's been well worth uh, the money that I spent on it. So the first option of an explanation of what he meant in verse number 19, the Spirit of Christ speaking through Noah as he preached to his current generation, we know it fell on deaf ears because the only people that were saved where Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, and the rest died. But they can't say they weren't warned. Fell on deaf ears. Option number two would be Christ himself preaching in the place of the dead to Old Testament believers. Thomas Oden reminds his readers of one teaching in the early church by quoting Clement of Alexandria. He's one of the great early church fathers. He wrote this, Christ preached the gospel in the place of the dead to bring salvation to awaiting believers. Those people who had faith in God in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, who were taken to the place of the dead, it wasn't torment, it was a holding place until the time of Jesus. This was part of the teaching of the early church. Let me read that again. Christ preached the gospel in the place of the dead to bring salvation to awaiting believers. This tradition continued into the teaching of various groups uh, as is evident by Odin's reference to the Russian Catechism, which reads, the two reasons for that happening, two reasons are assigned for the descent into the abode of the dead. Number one, to preach his victory over death. And number two, to deliver the souls which with faith awaited his coming. Okay. Now, hold that in your mind for just a second because I'm going to read something from Matthew that, that kind of feeds into this and feeds into this particular train of thought. And this is Matthew 25, verse 51 through 53. And I think Matthew's the only gospel that records this in it. I could be wrong, but I think that's right. When Jesus died on the cross, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Did y'all did y'all catch that in the Passion of the Christ? And I mean, they just kind of give you a quick blink into the temple. You see some tables and some stonework crumbling. And if you pay attention, you'll see the curtain that separated the holy from the holy holies, you see it ripped from top to bottom. Because I think I missed it the first time, but when I watched it again, I saw it and I thought, ah, there it is. The curtain has been torn from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Do you remember that? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now, wrap your mind around that one, and then explain it to me. So here's one possible interpretation of that. One possible interpretation would be that between death and resurrection, Christ descended into the abode of the dead and rescued Old Testament believers from the grip of death. They were delivered from that bondage and be and became the first to realize the privilege of believers that at death they are away from the body and at home with the Lord. Since Jesus' descent into the abode of the dead, all believers who die are at once with the Lord. So that has been taken out of the way now because Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ is risen. When we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Whereat in the old covenant, the understanding, the belief among some was when you died, you kind of went to a holding place. You didn't get to enter into heaven and glory uh, like a New Testament believer does. And now since Jesus has addressed all of that, there's no holding pen. On the Mount of Transfiguration, speaking to Jesus. Yes. yes. And they were Old Testament to Called up from the place of the dead. Mm -hmm. And obviously sent back. Yeah. What did the man on the lake say? Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. I thought this was talking to the No, no, he, he's still talking about the, the flood. Who was it 
that King Saul called up with a sorcerer? Was it Samuel? And Samuel said, why have you disturbed me? <laughs> you know, she called him up from the place of the dead. See, so here's, here's some people, here's some, even Christians, here's, here's something that, that people don't realize. When you have fortune tellers and things like that, they may have some sense of power, some sense of knowledge, but it didn't come from God. I mean, even the girl who followed Paul around and said, these, people, these men are preaching to us salvation. And Paul turned around and rebuked her and cast the demon out of her. I, I mean, there are some things that the fortune teller and people like that can tell you that are true and real that you may not even know yourself. But that does not come from God. You're looking for a source of knowledge, and it's not God. And by the Bible, Old Testament, and you like, says stay away from it. Stay away from it. Don't go there. You're looking for trouble. But even in that case, when King Saul, dealing with the trouble that he brought upon himself, I think it was Samuel he wanted brought back up. Here he came from the place of the dead because he asked him, why are you, why are you bringing me back like this? So anyway, that, that's, that's something we need to be aware of and, and you need to stay away from. Option number three, boom, is that Christ is preaching to the fallen angels in prison, declaring his victory over all things and their impending judgment and punishment. So let's think about that one for a minute. When you go to Ephesians chapter 4, and this is verse 7 through 10, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus says this, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he, Jesus says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Verse number 9. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that also he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So if you are victorious over all things, even death and the grave, does that not mean you have had to face it to get the victory? I mean, Alabama can't say. We've beat Georgia in 2021. Well, you hadn't played them yet. You don't know if you're going to beat them or not. So to gain a victory over something else, there has to be that encounter. And that's what various scriptures talk about in the Bible. You may remember what Jesus said at the Great Commission. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. When did he say that? He said that after the resurrection, after going into the grave, after facing sin and death and rising in victory over it. Listen to this one in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and following. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead? There's a resurrection and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Listen to this, verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So some think that Jesus, when he went down, uh, as Peter writes, that he spoke to the angels who are reserved in darkness and punishment. That's in Jude, verse number 6. There's only one chapter of Jude. Verse number 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. So some people, some scholars would believe he went and said, I won. You didn't. You followed Satan, not me. 
And I'm fixing to rise victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And one day, I will judge you. That's not a message I want to hear directed toward me. So that's another one of the thoughts about what this could mean. There's so little here in this little couple of verses that Peter shares. There's so little here. There's, there's, it's hard to build any great argument about what it truly means. But good scholars do their best to try to gain a better understanding because if it's included in the Bible, then it, it should be something beneficial to us. It, it should be something that should help us in some way. All right, we'll wrap up with verse number 21 and 22. There's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven as the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So when you hear that last verse, that, that kind of reinforces that option number three, that, that Jesus is demonstrating his victory from the very depths of the earth where the, the rebellious angels have been put in chains from, from the lowest of the low to the highest of the high, all angels and authorities and powers been made subject to him. But we don't want to forget what he said about baptism. Just as no one his family were saved through water, the followers of Christ are saved through water, the water of baptism. And Peter makes it clear he's not talking about an outward physical cleansing, but an inward work of God's grace. When we talk about sacraments and baptism, we talk about an outward sign of an inward work of grace. Isn't that a wonderful Wesleyan kind of thing? An outward sign of an inward work of grace. The resurrection of Jesus made this possible. It is the resurrected Christ who sits on the seat of authority at the right hand of God Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And now that doesn't have to scare us. As a matter of fact, that should excite us. Because the one who has been proclaimed King of kings and Lord of lords, all things being made subject to him, is the one in whom I have put my trust. The one in whose, in whose hands I have placed my life. So it doesn't matter what the world does to me. It doesn't matter what people do to me. Because he is mine and I am his. Amen? That's good news. Father, we love you. We thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. And the honor, the privilege, the joy it is to live a Christian life. To... Do good things, not because we're good, but because you're good and you live in us and you live through us and the fruit of your spirit is here. Goodness is part of that fruit. Fathers, we press into this day together with you and the body of Christ and we encounter the people of the world. We pray that they see Christ in us. And Father, if they are to be bold enough to ask us about the smile on our face, the joy in our heart, the hope that we have, Father, may we with humility, share with them our love for you, but more importantly, your love for us all. We thank you for that. Of course, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate you joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday. Have a blessed day.